So before I get too far into the content of this video, I want to share a little bit of context for anybody who isn't all that familiar with Catholic arrangements and politics and, and recent history. So I'm talking about the Second Vatican Council, which was what's called an ecumenical council hosted by the Catholic Church. And it was hosted over several years and presided over by two reigning popes, including John the 23rd and Paul the 6th, who are both now canonized as saints. Up until this point in the church's history, councils were called in order to resolve some specific controversy, as in someone's been teaching things that have led to debate and confusion. And so now the church needs to gather and prayerfully consider these things and make some sort of clarification about it. And that's one of the ways that we get dogmas in the Catholic Church. They are the result of someone teaching erroneous things and then the church stepping in and clarifying it through dogmas as well as anathemas, which are like condemnations of the erroneous teachings. But when Vatican II was called, there was no specific controversy that they were attending to. There was no dogma to be defined and there was no heresy to be condemned. Vatican II, it was claimed, was to be understood as a pastoral council rather than a dogmatic council. And right off the bat, characterizing this council as, as such a fundamentally novel thing compared to all the councils that came before it, seemed like an incredibly bold thing for a church to do, a church that is built upon tradition and a church that is constantly pressured to compromise that tradition, both from outside and from within. If you're gonna make such uncharacteristically audacious strides towards innovation, you'd think you'd want to have a lot of safeguards in place in case things go haywire, or at the very least anticipate the potential mess that could be created and then have some sort of contingency plan for it. So the focus of the council was to find a way to interact with and to evangelize the contemporary world. It was a response to a dramatically shifting and emerging global culture and a hope that the church would be able to find a way to remain relevant along with her message for the contemporary world. But an interesting correlation is that the church's ability to remain relevant and speak to the outside world has been a state of complete free fall. And if the intention was the opposite, but we've seen nothing but decline since then, I think any reasonable person would look at that and admit that we need to take a very hard and honest look at what's going on. Some are willing to do that, and from among them, some take a very negative view of the council, while others will relentlessly defend it and try to rationalize and explain away those consequences by saying things like, well, that would have happened and worse if it wasn't for the council. But in fact, there isn't really any way to know that. All we do know for sure is that the goals of the council remain unrealized. When you hear Catholics talk about the Second Vatican Council, you'll get a range of reactions to it, all the way from people who talk about it like it's the council, the greatest thing to ever happen to the church, and that it supersedes everything that came before it, to people who say that it's non-binding, that it's relentlessly ambiguous, and that it's full of a lot of heterodoxy, if not a little heresy. And for everyone other than the far end of the latter position that I just described, you will hear people say that you can't criticize the council, that it was binding and magisterial, and who are you to think that you know better? My first encounter with this kind of reproach against anybody who wants to critically discuss the consequences of the council came in an op-ed that was written in my archdiocesan newspaper. In it, the writer, who is a Monsignor, characterized the church prior to the council in extremely critical and condescending terms. The council, by contrast, he argued, made the church a much better, more open, accepting, and welcoming presence in the world. And I encountered this shortly after I became Catholic myself, and one of the reasons I did so was because I believed that if the church represented God who is truth, then you should be able to detect a current of immutability and consistency within her teachings. And I believe that I had found that in the Catholic Church. Her theology seemed to remain consistent all the way from scripture to the patristic era, the church fathers, all the way up to the modern day. But here I was reading that the church prior to the council was wrong in the way that it handled its affairs, if not in its actual teachings. And it wasn't hard for me to find this sentiment expressed by many people who proactively and, and passionately defended and upheld what they believed to be the accomplishments of the council and the ways that it made the church much better. They would say things like, if you don't fully accept and submit to every word of the council, then you're no different from a Protestant. But to make that argument, 
it requires a willingness to fully recognize the teaching authority or the magisterium of the Catholic Church, including all of its previous statements, its dogmas, and its councils. But you can't do that while simultaneously saying that Vatican II is in opposition to the way things were before. You can't claim that Vatican II was valid because you recognize the magisterium of the Catholic Church, but then hold previous teachings in contempt because those previous teachings were established and produced by the same magisterium. The way I see it, people who condemn or are at least highly critical of Vatican II are just participating in the same mentality and tradition of those who exclusively advocate for Vatican II. They're just picking and choosing the teachings from the magisterium that happen to reflect their pre-existing preferences. This is why Pope Benedict XVI tried to promote what he called a hermeneutic of continuity, which meant that any interpretation of the Second Vatican Council had to be in harmony and consistency with previous teachings as a necessary consistency within church teaching. So if you find an apparent contradiction between Vatican II and previous councils or dogmas, then your best bet is to stick with the traditional understanding since it is part of a 2000 year deposit of magisterial authority. So there's really two sides of the fence that I think a person can land on. On the one side, you could find people that say that Vatican II is a valid expression of magisterial authority as long as it's interpreted within that hermeneutic of continuity and seen as consistent with previous magisterial statements and and teachings or on the other side of the fence there are people who consider it invalid along with people who consider it the only valid magisterial expression both who are equally as guilty of schism lastly could i offer a layperson's perspective on the claim that you can't fault the council for the way things have gone since then but that you should offer your critique towards the way that the council has been implemented since then the thing about the second vatican council is that the documents that were written as a result of it even though the intention was to be as accessible and conversational to modern man as possible they're actually quite long and quite difficult to understand for anybody who isn't consistently immersed in theological content the vocation of a lay person makes it really difficult to spend an entire semester's worth of time trying to interpret and translate academic treatises. We have jobs and families to take care of, which is why we tend to rely on our pastors to explain to us what they say and what they mean. So if a lay person goes to mass one week and it's a Latin Tridentine mass in which Latin chant descends from the choir loft below to the people, there's a fragrance of incense in the air, the celebrant orients himself in the same direction as the congregation towards the east as we all look towards the rising sun in anticipation of the return of our blessed Lord. And a cultural expression that is grounded in hundreds of years of development. If that's what they experience one week, and then the next week they show up at Mass, and it's a hootenanny mass, that's actually what they called it, in which there are beatniks standing at the front, dressed like the Beatles, banging on tambourines, singing songs that nobody is familiar with, and the celebrant faces his audience now, and the sanctuary has been demolished, and then whitewashed with pastel colors. And then the, the pastor says, hey folks, this is what Vatican II is all about. The vast majority of lay people will accept his claim and they will either love it, they will grin and bear it, they will leave, which many did, or they will join schismatic movements. If the council's first order of business was to signal to everybody that, hey, the times they are a change in, and then the people that are responsible for interpreting the content of that council to the rest of us, they run way too enthusiastically off in that direction then shouldn't we consider that the council, or at the very least the council fathers, bear some responsibility for that? Now, I wouldn't presume to answer that question, but I do sympathize with people who ask it. Thank you so much for watching that. I really hope that you enjoyed it and that you got something out of it. And if you did, and you want to consume more content like this, then please consider subscribing to my channel. Or if you saw this on Facebook, then like my page and follow along. If you're on YouTube, it's not enough anymore to subscribe because YouTube wants to think that it can tell you what you should watch instead of what you actually want to watch. So in this case, you actually have to hit that little bell to be notified as to whether or not I've uploaded something more recently. So please subscribe and hit the bell at the 
the same time. That really helps me out a lot. And if you could consider sharing this among your social network, that helps me a lot too. And if you wanna support the making of these videos, please consider supporting my business, which is a communications and strategic marketing company who specializes especially in branding and web design. And this is especially catered towards ministries and apostolates and parishes. We have a parish web design system that we've built specifically for parishes and churches that is affordable, but also beautifully packaged and easy to use. So if you're interested in that, check out my business, which is holdsworthdesign.com and hit the contact uh, button in the navigation and get in touch and, and we can figure out if there's a good fit for you there.